Thank you. Perfect show. Yeah. Don't worry. Keep it open. Yeah, that's what the question is. Bad as it sounds. We have an aging population, so the amount of people that are available to do calls is less, and the amount of people of the aging population is growing. Uh, the town of Boulder Junction has over 30 percent of people over 65, and I forget what percentage is over 85. So you've got uh, increased demand. Um, their family live far away. You know, they fall and they can't get up, things like that. So the increasing aging population, which is only going to go up more and more, um, increases demand as well. All the young people that I have, they're doing it as their second or third job. They're not doing it as I'm doing this. Yes, they want to do it to help because obviously they're not getting rich off of it, but they're doing it as a second or third job because that's they have to make money. They have to provide for their families. The pool up here for those kind of jobs has diminished in the last 10 years significantly, significantly. You know, until these services get healthy rosters, we, we give them resources already. I mean, I've been with the RTEC for you know, many years and the Healthcare Coalition, and we, we offer them as much as we can. We offer training and conferences and, and, and supplies and equipment and that sort of stuff, and, and that's good stuff, but they can't come to training. They don't come to conferences because they're short-staffed and they're, they work so much, you know. How many of you are nervous sitting here now being away from your, your areas? You don't know if the next call is going to get covered. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we talk about this, you know, and you keep saying to get the paramedic level services up here, it's hard up here to find a paramedic. And, it, and it, you know, our, we have a local college that does, does great when we need things, but they can't keep running a paramedic curriculum when you talk about you can't even get the basics because people are working two jobs or whatever. You know, they, they can't run a class for, for one person or whatever. And I don't know what the answer is, if there's, you know, grants out there, something that, you know, subsidies, something that could go to help, I don't know, help with that. Because that's that's still a problem, too. To, right now, the, what is the closest paramedic class? An hour and a half away? And when you're talking, working two jobs, and, and then on top of the hours, it, it's tough. Yeah, and I think even looking at, you know, your northern region, there are the flexible staffing components. There are paramedics that live in your northern region. You know, is that an option? But again, it's going to come down to money. You know, I, most of us can't just volunteer all our time. And we're all credentialed. I mean, I'm a credential <coughs> for support services, and that's what, that's basically regionalization. Um, you, you mentioned the, the, the issue of maybe we're going to have to pay more for providing the service. You know, it is, it is a service community and it's going to just cost people more in, in the future. Um, that's easy to start thinking about. Think, you know, I hear some people talk about, well, look at how much you pay every month or whatever for garbage collection. You know, if you're in an area where you, you pay for that, it's, it's quite a bit compared to what you pay for EMS. But it's a lot easier to sell that because you need your garbage picked up every week, every other week, whatever. People don't think, I'm going to need an ambulance. They don't want to pay for a service that they don't think they're going to need. I mean, we, we have that issue in all sorts of emergency preparedness. Nobody wants to pay for just the preparedness aspect of it. So, um, And even if we do start talking about paying people more to, to fill the positions, you know, having full-time staff, what have you, it's you're going to have to pay pretty decently to, to recruit. It would be nice if there was some assistance at this from the state level to enable the high quality service that these folks have talked about relative to an aging population in a real rural where you got 25 miles in between communities. The, my view point coming is human resources. And I see that with my fire department and I see that with my EMS service, okay? My EMS age group, except for two new EMRs that Donna just brought aboard, probably the age group is 62, 65. Okay, so we're old. What would happen, what would help, and I've talked to one of the other, two of the other town chairmen up in my neck of the woods, is a while back they were talking about, as they did in the fire department, allowing for regionalized fire departments, where fire departments could combine within small towns. Okay? Uh, 
When we get to ambulance services, they did not do that in section 60.565, which is a state statute for ambulance service. The one for fire says, yeah, you can regionalize, have combined, towns can combine their fire departments. It's small. A small rural area up here, that would help. Many areas of, uh, uh, in, the, uh, rural, in the rural type counties have their own ways that they may be able to do things outside of the main standard, if you will. So I don't know if that's a way too general of a statement, but I, I, we run into that from time to time, and, and it, it is that there has to be exceptions available, there should be exceptions available to what is done everywhere else in the state, maybe from a legislative or from a rules and regulation standpoint that hampers, kind of like what they just mentioned about Boulder Junction and so on. You know, why does it have to be a state law that says, hey, you can't do that, or no, you have to do it this way? Releasing some of that responsibility and authority to a county or a townships within a county would probably better enable the people that are on the ground doing the stuff to say, we can figure this out on our own and get the job done without having to have a law that says we can't do it that way. If you were to take a look at the four towns in my area, because the odds of all four ambulances, or two of them, or three of them being out at the same time are rather nil, okay? There's a lot of money sitting there. So if the legislative would get and change that, allow us to regionalize our ambulance services, it spreads out the demand on the people, okay? So you're the state legislator up in Missouri, or you and Tiffany, okay? It sure would be helpful you guys would do that now okay kind of sneak it in the budget bill <laughs> right? so it's a real slippery slope because when you change over to a county funded arena now the county has responsibility to provide a very efficient service and all of a sudden you've got all the resources you've talked about out in the county and they're gonna divvy out those pennies and, and somebody always loses out because we can't the, the county won't fund seven services you know, in Lincoln County, we have two ambulance services, one in Merrill, right. one in Tomahawk. The one, Tomahawk benefits totally because it loses $10,000 a month at least um, just in our expenses. Uh, but the run volume down in Merrill makes up for it, but there's still only three ambulances in the county. So when you look at the population densities and stuff like that, those outlying areas always start to lose out. Well, that's one of the reasons why I think the county scenario is not going to work that they buy this county because what we, we're afraid of as a town is all of a sudden you're going to have two or three paramedic units and then uh, a couple EMRs here or there. And then next thing you know, it's a half hour to get to the right. paramedic to get from Eagle River up to the state line. And the people that live on the state line, no, we don't want to wait that long. We want you, the towns, to have their own. And that's where the feedback would be to have a regional ambulance service and help us if we have uh, a bad accident on 51 where we need seven or eight ambulances like does happen all of a sudden we only got two in the whole county I mean, give me a break here right we had that argument the other day on ems or fire and ems because we can't raise our budgets we're locked in so if you want to put more money into roads you've got to take from peter to pay paul okay or you got to go before the people and it gets to be. So all I'm saying is, yeah, if we were to take a look at regionalizing, maybe, would it work? I don't know. But we should have that ability at the town level to talk among ourselves, okay, and say, how can we do it? I think that would work in our specific situation, what, what he's talking about. I mean, our situation is different and unique, and I, I do think that in our situation, in our four townships, that would work. So you'd like the flexibility to find a uh, geography that makes sense a, for a your location, areas. a geography of right. where we can station to service that whole area. One thing I find in my community when I talk about EMS and I look for money, I have no problem getting it. My yep. EMS director will verify that. We had a gentleman walked in one night at a pizza hut and said, here, you guys have called my wife a couple of times, here's a check for 10 grand towards your really? new cot. 
okay, before we purchase a new ambulance. It was a few dollars, over $190,000. Not one person in the town, when they found out what we spent and what it was for, was negative. They were positive. We're already doing cost shifting as far as EMS and fire. Um, our, for example, I mean, EMS and fire is all one. EMS does, if we have 170 calls, EMS does 170 calls. And we bring in money for that, mostly it's Medicare or whatever. And fire, the cost shift is to fire because fire a volunteer doesn't, doesn't charge for anything. So we are already supporting fire as it is. Um, and yet, uh, it's great to give the, the idea of giving EMS more money, but if it goes to the fire department, it's the tail wagging the dog. EMS does you know, a ton of the runs and fire controls the money, the budget, the million dollars worth of equipment that sits there. So you can give, you give my department all you'd like, but um, that, that it's gonna trickle down to EMS is um, maybe. So we have a combination. One township has a paid squad. The other township has two squads sitting in it that are volunteer. It's one service, but it covers six townships. And each of the townships is contracted yearly, which recently was a fight because a um, nearby fire department started up in the town next door and decided they were going to jump over to our area and try to entice a cheaper they can do it cheaper than what we can so it was very much a fight last year so to me that's a huge struggle to not know at budget time that these towns are going to be on board with me we're a very poor county we don't have a hospital in our county we are the county that has no forest yeah, yeah. Um, we're mainly forest crop and we have very very poor communications you may get a page you may not get a page um we rely you mean on like a, cell service communications on or both broadband? cell and radios for communications right. and there's many areas where cell phones don't work and radios don't work i'd be on highway 51 and not be able to transmit mm -hmm. yep right on highway 51 coming in from the north and there's been times when i can't get phone signal, can't send something. You can't talk to the hospital. Can't talk to the hospital. We also have three areas that are um, very popular drug areas and have now become quite unsafe. And we do not have radios and we do not have phones in these areas. Yeah. What Internet's also part of the educational component. You know, we use some online things, and although it's gotten much better than it was previously, we still have students that really struggle for internet access, and so I think we could do a lot more that way. But it's hard because you almost segregate students that don't have good, solid access to internet. Yeah. You know, if, if you set it up that way, it, it's very, it's a, it's a tough balance because if you require it for everybody, yeah. is it fair to those students that they don't have that same access as somebody else that has good access? And, I mean, I've, I've lived in this area for six or seven years now, and they, you know, covering that issue as a newspaper reporter and seeing all this money come out of the state or the federal government or whatever, and you still have this just huge problem with Internet up in this area. And this is a, this is a topic. There's a lot of, when, when you see a lot of the news stories about Internet connection or whatever, a lot of the focus is on business. They don't talk about some of the stuff that you guys have to deal with uh, in the emergency medical field uh, and communications with hospitals and that sort of thing. So and maybe that's another thing that needs to be uh, communicated to Madison, what have you. Our students don't. To, I, our mean yeah. kind of our district, not necessarily ours, but um, although it's a tough testing, um, they actually usually come in pretty well prepared. So we don't see what I know happens around the state. And it's always nobody likes National Register test. I don't ever want to have to take one again in my life. I know nobody else in here does either. Yeah. Um, but thankfully, um, we've been able to hopefully prepare them pretty well. So you probably might not hear that. I mean, it's still a beast in itself. But, yeah. Um, 
honestly, there's a difference. I have people that went through yeah. Dana's program, and I have people that went through another tech, well, actually, two other technical college programs. And I actually have two people that are sitting that got one got an A, one got a B in their EMR class, and they cannot pass national registry. You've touched on this a little bit in the beginning. You know, we've done a poor job um, educating the consumers of these services because mm -hmm. everybody just picks up the phone and calls 911 and, 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 and we're there kind of thing. And you're uh, an ambulance driver or you're a paramedic. You know, nobody knows the different levels of what your community provides you for an ambulance service, what you can get. I'm getting an ambulance driver, you know, and things. And so I think that's a big piece of this puzzle is, you know, the, the general community, the public, has no idea, you know, what their community provides for EMS. That's true. You know, and it really doesn't matter to me until I have to pick up that phone and call 911. Then it matters to me. And then I realize that my ambulance is coming from 30 miles away and, you know, and, and things. So um, I think one of the biggest things we need to do is, you know, yeah. educate the consumers that this is EMS and this is what we do and this is what the different levels of EMS is. And talk about cost. Talk about the volunteerism. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think people even have the slightest idea how big of a problem uh, we're having today to supply EMS to the community. I mean, it's, it's, whether you're a volunteer service, paid on call, whatever you have, you know, full-time group like, you know, some of our groups, it's a problem. That's true. Last call.